this, and uh, so I'm going to run through it, sections of it pretty fast. Um, but uh, hopefully we can get all, uh, get all the way through it. <clears throat> so to uh, start out, um, I want to talk about what uh, what is a failure. Uh, what do we mean by failure? Um, and one uh, good way of looking at that um, is to take a look at the, uh, the design by contract view of programming uh, as espoused by Bertrand Mayer. And in that view, every, um, every method has a contract with its caller. It says, um, the contract says, give me certain inputs and I'll give you certain outputs um, or certain side effects. And uh, uh, Mayer wrote a, or created a programming language called Eiffel, and uh, that's pertinent because um, Eiffel's exception handling system was strongly influential on Ruby's. So a, um, in this, this view of programming um, as contracts, every method has a contract, and a failure is simply when a failure is when a method is unable to fulfill its contract. And this could happen for, um, for several reasons. Um, there could be a mistake in the methods, in, in the way the method is called. Now, technically this isn't a failure of the method, but it may be the method's responsibility to report uh, the fact that it was called wrong. Uh, there may be just a plain old mistake in, in the way the method is coded, uh, like uh, substituting a uh, string for, for a symbol. Uh, there may be there may be a, um, a misunderstanding. Maybe there was a, a case that the programmer didn't know about, and or there may just be a, a failure in some um, element that's completely external to the program. <clears throat> so I want to uh, for the next few minutes I want to just go through a uh, kind of a whirlwind tour of Ruby's exception system and uh, go over some things some things that you, maybe you do know. Um, and, uh, and then some things that you might not know. Um, every exception <laughs> starts with a raise. Um, well, actually, either it starts with a call to raise or a call to fail. Uh, these two are synonyms, and uh, they, they both do the exact same thing. Uh, in recent years, I've noticed that raise is, has become a little bit more common than fail, and it's really just a, a matter of taste. Um, I was talking to Jim about this, and uh, he has a convention that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, he uses fail for um, for most uh, for most cases. He uses fail to indicate a failure, and then he uses raise only when he is re-raising an exception uh, explicitly. And I kind of like this convention. I'm thinking about using it more in my own code. No. Uh, so there's a bunch of, a bunch of ways to uh, raise exceptions. We can call raise without anything. Just raise the runtime error. We can call it with a string. Um, we can call it with a uh, specific class. Uh, there, if you supply the third argument to raise, you can customize the backtrace. And this is handy for um, uh, for things like assertions, where you really want the backtrace to point to the place where the assertion was made, not to the place where the assert method was defined. Now, um, raise is not actually a Ruby keyword. Raise is just a method um, defined on kernel. And as we all know, in Ruby, if something is a method, we can redefine it. So there's some things you can do with that that are kind of fun. Um, here's just a silly example. Uh, it, we could make a program where instead of exceptions bubbling up the call stack like they normally do, they just instantly exit the program. And here's, a, uh, here's an implementation of that. Um, a possibly more useful uh, <laughs> usage of, uh, of this fact is uh, I've got a gem called Hammer Time, which is basically a list or small talk style uh, error console for Ruby, where instead of, um, instead of just the program ending and you get a backtrace, when the, the, uh, when the exception is first raised, you can actually look at the, uh, you can look at the environment where it was raised and you can, you can debug um, right there where it was raised. <clears throat> So what does raise actually do? Uh, raise goes through through four steps. Uh, the first step is to get the exception object. Second step is to, to set the backtrace. The third step uh, is to set the global error variable. 
And then finally, fourth step is to throw the, uh, that exception of the, of the, call, to, the call chain. <clears throat> so uh, taking a look at those in a little bit more detail, um, getting the exception object. Now, when you look at the way you call raise, uh, you might think that it's what it's doing internally is something like the first example here, where it's calling exception or calling dot new on the class that you pass it. But actually, what it's calling is it's calling a method called exception to generate that exception object. And on Ruby's uh, built-in exception class, exception is defined at both the instance and at the class level. At the instance level, uh, calling with no arguments just gives you the same object back. Calling it with with arguments gives you kind of a duplicate of that exception. Um, and at the class level, it's basically equivalent to calling dot new. <coughs> now this is interesting because it means that we could actually define our own dot exception uh, methods. And you can you can almost think of dot exception as um, as like an equivalent to 2s or 2a. It's almost like uh, a way of saying to the object, convert yourself to an exception. So um, I haven't really seen this used in practice much, but this is just a little example where you could uh, you could tell an HTTP response, for instance, to generate its own exception instead of deciding what exception to raise. <clears throat> Step two, um, we set the backtrace. Uh, this is either going to be set from the uh, whatever the current backtrace is, or if you supply a custom one, it's going to be that, uh, and that's set on the exception object separately from creating it. In step three, we, it sets the global error variable, which is uh, the dollar bang variable. It's not really a global, it's actually a thread, a thread local um, variable, um, but it looks like a global. And um, what this little piece of code demonstrates is that as long as an exception is active, as long as it's not been handled, that, um, that global error variable is set. But uh, once it's been handled, then the, the, the variable goes back to nil. And uh, what, else, what, what this also demonstrates is that, um, that if, you, if you find the dollar bang syntax a little too inscrutable, you can require the English library, and then you can call it error info. And then um, finally, raise tosses that exception of the call chain uh, where it continues to, to uh, go up, up the stack until something either, either handles it or it uh, reaches the top level of the program. <clears throat> so um, now that we've raised an exception, um, we, need to, uh, we need to hopefully handle it. Rescue is how we do that. Uh, you can call rescue a number of ways as well. Uh, you can call it with no arguments, uh, which is equivalent to catching standard error. Uh, notably, it won't catch a whole bunch of uh, uh, exceptions that aren't descended from standard error. Um, you can catch it. You can uh, give a name to the uh, exception. You can uh, also provide specific classes or a list of classes uh, to define what you want to catch or what you want to rescue. Uh, now, when you look at the syntax of rescues, you might think that looks a little bit like Ruby's case statements. And in fact, the way Ruby uh, decides what uh, whether a rescue, a rescue clause matches an exception is very similar to the way it does uh, case matching. So what it's actually doing is it's calling the three equals operator on um, between that class and that exception to see if it matches. And uh, that means that we could actually uh, we could have a little fun with that too. We could um, instead of providing a class, we could uh, create a little custom matcher fun. Uh, in fact, a little custom matcher function so that we can then uh, say something like this. We can say rescue errors with message matching this, uh, this regular expression. Um, and uh, one little gotcha here, though, is that for some reason, Ruby requires that whatever we pass to rescue, it must be either a class or a module. Then it just calls the three equals operator on it. It doesn't actually do anything with its classiness or modulness, but it requires that it be a class or module, which is why uh, in this code, I'm creating a new module. <clears throat> can, can it just pretend to be a class or module? As long as um, it duct types? I, I'm not certain. In, in, in MRI, uh, probably not. I, I think um, it may be checking at a too low a level for you to, to, for you to fake. Um, so um, 
then you've got after after rescues, you can put in an uninsured clause, um, which is just a good good place that everything in the insured clause will always be executed error or not. It's a good place to put cleanup code. Uh, one gotcha with the insured clause uh, that was documented by Les Hill is that if you explicitly return, if you have an error, something uh, raises an error, uh, raises an exception, and um, and then explicit, and then uh, in the insure clause, something explicitly returns. Uh, the exception will be effectively thrown away. Uh, it will not be prop propagated up, and this may not be what you're expecting. Uh, so it's probably best to just avoid using explicit returns in an insure clause. Ruby is one of the few languages that gives us uh, a retry for exceptions. Retry uh, gives us a way to to um, in in, re in rescuing exception to say, go back to the enclosing begin, to the beginning of this, that statement, or go back to the beginning of that method and try again. The one thing you want to be careful of when you're using retry is not to get into an infinite retry loop, so you have to have some kind of counter uh, or some other way of just, uh, deciding, okay, we've retried tried enough times, we're going to give up. So what happens, what happens when, we, um, when we raise a new exception during uh, during the handling of another exception. Well, um, if we just raise a brand new exception, the original exception is thrown away. There is no record of, ex of its existence. There's no way to find out um, what it was. And um, I've kind of, um, several times, I've found out the hard way that, that Rails code does this. Um, because I'll be tracking an exception back to its source, and then I'll realize it was actually generated while another exception was being handled. And I have no idea what that original exception was. So um, please don't do this. Um, instead, use nested exceptions. And the nested exception pattern is just, it's just an exception object with an extra slot on it uh, to refer to the original exception that was being handled when this exception was uh, generated. Not part of, it's not part of Ruby, but it's very simple to define your own nested exception class. Um, this one's being a little bit clever uh, by uh, using the global error variable as the default for the uh, for the original exception. So it basically auto detects uh, whether there was a an active exception while uh, while it was when it was raised. Uh, you can you can take the the error that you caught and re-raise it. If you just if you just call raise on that, it's going to raise the exact same object. It's not going to generate a new one, uh, which is what this. This little piece of code demonstrates the same object. Uh, you can call you can call raise uh, on the on the exception that you caught, but you can provide a new message. For instance, this is useful. For instance, for like clarifying the message when you when you know a little bit more context information and you want to add uh, some clarification to the uh, exception to the exception message. Um, you can also provide a custom uh, custom backtrace as well. <coughs> If you call raise with no arguments, it will it will raise the uh, current re-raise the current active exception. Question: hmm? If you if you raise with explicitly the caught exception, does that preserve the backtrace? <coughs> Isn't that is that? Yeah, that'll uh, preserve the backtrace. The question is, um, um, wait, actually, restate the question. If, if you explicitly re-raise as opposed to raise with no argument, does that preserve the backtrace? Um, so it, the question is, if you explicitly re-raise as opposed to um, raise with no arguments, uh, does that preserve the backtrace? I believe they are semantically identical. Um, so here's another little, uh, here's, here's some more fun with, um, with redefining raise. Uh, in some languages, it's, not per it's considered not permissible to do this, to do this double raise thing where you raise an exception while handling another one. And there are reasons for that because, I mean, you can, uh, you can get into trouble with that. It can be hard to debug. Uh, you can also wind up not cleaning up resources um, when that happens. So if you wanted to mimic one of those languages, you, you could do it pretty easily in Ruby. You could redefine raise so that it checks to see if there is currently an active exception and says, no, you can't do that. I'm just going to exit the program. And uh, in this code, I've, all, I've, I've also defined a, a little helper method to, to enable us to explicitly say, I have handled this exception, and now I'm raising a new one. And uh, what that does uh, is it just sets the global error variable back to nil. And there's a, uh, an example of using it and, ex and, saying, and explicitly saying, I've handled this exception. 
Uh, if, if, we, if an exception continues to bubble up the call stack and nothing rescues it, eventually uh, Ruby will catch it and terminate the program. But before it terminates the program, it will, it will uh, execute various, at, at various exit hooks. And uh, this is useful because um, in some contexts, we might want to be able to define, we might want to be able to capture some information about a crash, uh, but we might, it might not be convenient uh, to wrap a big old, uh, begin, rescue, end around our entire program. For instance, where would you put that in, in a Rails app? Uh, but we can still, we can still actually uh, attach a handler, uh, which will do some, some crash logging for us. So here's a, a little simple crash logger. It, uh, it's in an add exit, which will, be, which will be executed when the program ends. And it's just checking that global error variable to say, is there an active exception? If so, I'm going to log some information about it. I'm going to log a timestamp, a message, backtrace. In this case, I'm also logging uh, all the versions of all the gems that were loaded at the time of the crash. I'm sure you can probably think of lots of other information that you would uh, throw into a, a, a crash log like this. So um, once we've once we've rescued um, once we've rescued an exception, there are various ways we could we could handle that exception. And um, one of the uh, most simple ways, if it's if we decide that it's not a not a fatal issue, is we could just return some kind of error value uh, instead of um, instead of whatever, whatever the expected return was. And uh, the, in Ruby, typically the error va value is nil. Uh, sometimes this is all you need, but, but nil can be pretty uncommunicative. Um, uh, a related approach is, is to return, rather than nil, to return some kind of benign value. And uh, this is kind of an underused technique, I think, uh, but it's, it's really helpful when, you, when you've ascertained that an exception is not doesn't represent an issue that's worth ending the program or ending the request over. Um, you can just substitute some sort of known safe value, which indicates that there was a problem, but doesn't, but but uh, satisfies the expectations of the caller in such a way that doesn't break the caller. Uh, something else you might want to do uh, in handling exception is you might want to report it, log it to a file, send an email, report it to some external uh, exception reporting service. And um, what you want to be careful of here is you want to be careful of inadvertently making the, pro the problem worse. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I worked on a project once where we had a bunch of a bunch of systems. Um, a bunch of, we had a bunch of uh, basically systems processing jobs, and uh, occasionally the jobs would crash. And we had implemented a very simple. Um, uh, exception notifier where where when a job would crash, it would send us an email. It would send us an email using our our Gmail account. Um, you know, real basic, but it worked. Uh, then one one day we rolled out a version which caused the jobs to crash a lot more often. And in fact, they crashed so often that all of the notifications being sent by Gmail to us developers uh, became so frequent that Gmail started throttling our account, which came through to the program as an SMTP error. Now, the crash logging code uh, had not been built to handle SMTP errors. So the workers, instead of logging the exception and then moving on to the next job, uh, the workers started crashing hard. Um, this was bad enough, because now we had a bunch of dead workers. But it didn't stop there. Because we had other unrelated systems that also used this basic uh, email notification system, which were now getting as they were now using, they were all using the same email account. Uh, they were now getting SMTP errors as well, and they also had not been written to handle SMTP errors. So now we have unrelated systems going down because of this. So this is a um, this is a classic example of a failure cascade, and um, and it's something to, to really look out for when you start getting fancier with your with your your error reporting. Um, a useful pattern to uh, to deal with error cascades, uh, failure cascades, is the uh, the circuit breaker pattern, uh, which is described in detail in Michael Nygaard's book uh, Release It. 
And uh, I'm not sure I have time to go over the pattern in detail right now, but basically uh, it's, the idea is to implement your, your system in such a way that it counts the number of failures and when, when they go over a, a, a threshold, the circuit breaker trips and, um, and that system is no longer permitted to operate for a while, either, either a, uh, until a timeout uh, runs up or until some kind of human intervention. So um, that was our little uh, whirlwind tour of exception handling uh, in Ruby. Now, uh, for the rest of this talk, I, I want to talk a little bit more philosophically about uh, just some advice um, and some ideas for how to structure your, your apps uh, or your library's failure handling strategy. Uh, so first up, um, just a general rule, and, and a lot of you have probably heard this before, exceptions, uh, exceptions should be for exceptional circumstances. Uh, and, and another way of stating that is exceptions should not be expected. So, um, you know, things like invalid user input are not, are, are, are typically something that you can expect. Uh, so that might not warrant an exception. And that's, that you can see that line of thinking in active record save method, the default save method doesn't, doesn't raise an exception if there is invalid user input because that's the sort of thing that, that you expect to happen. Uh, one rule of thumb for deciding whether to raise an exception uh, is expressed in the, uh, the pragmatic programmer. Um, and the question to ask yourself is, uh, if I removed, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the best case scenario, if I removed all of the exception handling code in my app, would it still run? You know, assuming that nothing broke. Assuming that, that it's, it's um, not running into any problems, would it still would it still run? And uh, you know, if, it, if it's if if it's running depends on exception handling, then maybe you want to revisit how you uh, structured your your failure handling strategy. Uh, if you occasionally you run into situations where you really want to do something like an exception, you want to break out of multiple levels of execution, but it's not an exceptional circumstance. And uh, for that, Ruby gives us catch and throw. Uh, which are really confusing to people coming from other languages because that's, those are the terms that they use for exceptions. But catch and throw are for non-exceptional circumstances, but basically give you the same semantics where you can break out of multiple levels of execution. Uh, and uh, uh, Sinatra and Rack uh, have a pretty good example of this built in because you can, uh, you can do this thing with, la with the, the last modified command, which, which works with the browser to uh, short circuit the execution of a uh, of an action based on on whether the browser already has the most recent uh, version of that resource. And uh, the way that's implemented internally is that it's 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 checking some browser headers and then it's using throw to terminate that action before it goes any further. And then Rack catches that part of the chain. <clears throat> so um, there's sort of an internal debate about what exactly does constitute an exception. Um, you know, is, a, is an end of file, uh, is an end of file a, a failure? Uh, is a, a missing hash key a failure? Uh, what about a 404? And the answer to all of these really is uh, it depends. Uh, it really depends on the circumstances. But when you raise an exception, uh, you force the issue. You say, I know that this is, this is a failure. And uh, whenever there is a, a situation in programming where, um, where it's one of these it depends kind of questions, uh, I always look for a way to, to punt the question to, some, to somebody else, to kind of punt it down the line. And one way to do that with failures um, is something, is, is something I, I think of as, as the, uh, the caller-defined caller failure strategy or the caller-defined fallback strategy uh, pattern. And you can see this in Ruby. In um, a great example of it is the fetch method. Fetch is defined. Uh, so how many people know what fetch does? I have a personal mission. I, I put this. I put something about fetch in, in all of my talks, and and, I, and, and someday I'm going to ask that question to everybody in the room and raise their hands. No, I'll be done. Um, so fetch is great. Fetch um, is defined on on hash and array and, and various collections. And the way it works is 
Uh, you pass it a key, and if the key exists in the collection, then it just gives you the value back, uh, just like using using square brackets. But if the uh, if the key isn't there, then it executes your code, whatever you provided in, in the block, to decide what to do in the case of you know, what to do for a fallback. And that's a way of delegating the decision about whether this is a failure case up to the caller, because uh, the, the caller decides uh, whether to just return some kind of benign value or whether to raise an exception. And it also just decides what exception that should be, uh, which, is, which is really helpful sometimes. So um, in earlier um, feed, feedback for earlier versions of this talk, um, people came to me and said, um, well, that's all fine and good. But, but really, when should I raise an exception? So I, I thought about it a little bit more. I came up with five questions that uh, might, you might find useful to ask yourself when you're trying to decide whether it's a good situation, whether it's a, you're a good place to raise an exception. Uh, number one, um, we talked about this already, is the situation truly unexpected? Is it something that we can, we can reasonably expect, like uh, user input invalid, um, or is it something that we really don't expect? Number two, Am I prepared to end the program? Remember, any exception can potentially end the program, or, or in the case of a web application, it can end the request. You know, and, um, and so sometimes when you look at it from that perspective, um, when you think about it from that perspective, you realize, no, this really isn't worth ending the request over. Maybe I should just return some kind of benign value that I, you know, that I can see in the output that something went wrong, but it doesn't actually kill the request. Um, number three, um, can I punt the decision up? Is there some way of delegating this, delegating the uh, the call about whether or not to raise an exception here of the call chain? Am I throwing away valuable diagnostics? If you have a, if you have some sort of long-running, expensive operation. Um, or, an, or an operation that's difficult to run again. Maybe it's not idempotent, and uh, you can't really run it again easily. If, and if you then raise an exception, if you, if you call that method and something goes wrong, some, and, and you raise an exception for some trivial reason, um, and you wind up throwing away all of the context and all the information that was collected by that long-running operation, that might not be such a good plan. So, um, you know, in a case where you have some kind of expensive operation, it might be good to find a way to either attach more, more of that information to the exception before you throw it, or to, to execute in a, in a degraded mode rather than raising an exception. And question number five, um, would continuing forwards result in a, uh, in a less useful exception, and and this is this is a case where sometimes it's better to fail fast. So if you have bad input, it's often better to detect that as early as possible and bomb out uh, rather than you know going going several lines further and getting some mysterious um, can't convert nil into string exception. Um, Exceptions by exception handling by their nature or by its nature can complicate code. And this is one of the complaints that you see um, from people that are, aren't fans of exceptions is that it really is kind of like go to. It, it can turn code uh, into, into uh, something resembling spaghetti code. Um, and, uh, and particularly if you've ever seen if you've ever seen Ruby code that has multiple levels of nested begin blocks, uh, where it's, you know, try this, and if that doesn't work, well, try this, well, if that doesn't work, try this, uh, it can be really hard to follow. I, I, I run across pieces of code like this sometimes, and invariably they are some of the buggiest, some of the hardest to test, um, and some of the hardest to understand pieces of code in the system. So um, I actually think of begin as, as something of a code smell in Ruby. Um, something that I try to avoid. Um, and what I, and, and um, Ruby gives us a really elegant way of getting away from the begin rescue end block. Because in Ruby, there's, every method has an, ex, has an implicit uh, begin block. 
that starts at the beginning of the method. And when you use when you use an implicit begin block and then and then put a rescue and whatever your your uh, failure handling is for that method, you get this great um, you get this great dividing line down the middle of the method where you have here's here's the business logic up here and then here's the failure handling down here. And it's this, this great organizing principle. And, and I find that, that when I structure my code to, uh, to take advantage of that and to only have uh, that level of, you know, that level of, of nesting as far as, as exception handling goes, it really leads to more um, understandable code, more testable code. Um, and uh, and one, way of, one way of refactoring code that uses a lot of begin blocks um, to towards this use of the implicit begin uh, idiom in Ruby is to use something that I'm, I'm calling uh, contingency methods. It's the best name I've come up with for it. But basically, it's the idea of if you have some kind of failure policy, extracting that policy into a method of its own. And all that method does is yield to the block and then um, and then do whatever that failure handling policy is. So do the uh, the failure handling, and you can. You can take code that's that has a, you know if you have some library that every time you call it you have to handle certain exceptions. You can factor that that exception handling out into a, uh, a contingency method and then use that everywhere. Certain methods in a program are critical. Um, an example of a critical method is the um, the crash logging method uh, that I was talking about earlier, where we were logging methods to, uh, or logging exceptions uh, via email. And that, that's an example of code that you really want to work well. Um, and uh, it's bad, you know, it, it, it's code you want to be reliable. Um, and um, a useful, a useful um, concept when you're thinking about uh, critical methods like this is to think about them, evaluate them in terms of their level of exception safety. And exception safety is just defines the, um, it just describes how a method will behave in the presence of exceptions. And classically, there are three uh, levels of exception safety. So the, uh, the lowest level is the weak guarantee. The weak guarantee says that that if an exception is raised anywhere in this method, the object will be left in a consistent state. Not necessarily the same state that it was in, um, but consistent means basically that it won't have, for instance, dangling references to other objects that don't exist or to database records that don't exist or something like that. Then you have the strong guarantee. The strong guarantee says uh, the object will be rolled back to its, to its beginning state, so it's transactional. Uh, so if an exception is raised, it'll be It'll just be rolled back as if the method was never called. And then finally, the no-throw guarantee says that um, says that, that no exceptions at all will be propagated out of this method. So, um, if you look at this this little little chunk of code here, um, how many places in this code could raise an exception? Just go ahead and yell some out if you think of some. So it's actually kind of a trick question. Ruby makes no guarantees about um, about where exceptions might be raised, and there are some exceptions that could be raised literally anywhere. So if somebody presses Control C while that program is running. That signal exception is going to bubble up wherever the Ruby interpreter decides to uh, to to bubble it up. Um, if the program runs out of memory, that could that exception could come from from anywhere in your code. Ruby has no guarantees about this. You know, this op operation will raise exceptions. This operation won't. So we have kind of a conundrum. Uh, we know that certain we know that uh, certain methods are critical. We want to make assertions about their their exception safety. We know that it's you know it's good to understand their exception safety characteristics, and um, and yet we know in Ruby that there's no way of um, that there's no way of knowing 
uh, where on the code exceptions will propagate. So we really need a way of just testing to see if a if a method meets the uh, the exception safety guarantees that we want it to. And um, there's actually a technique for doing this. And uh, the way it works is we we'll, we take some code under test. Here's a here's a little a little uh, method that swaps keys in a hash, and we put it in uh, a test harness, uh, and we make some of we uh, we basically we run we run some code that exercise or we give that test harness some code that will exercise the uh, the code under test, and what that harness does is it runs that code once in record mode and records each point where the code calls an external method. Uh, so in this case, it's it's recorded um, it's recorded four uh, calls to external methods, uh, calls to hash methods in this case, and, uh, and it keeps that recording around. Then we make some assertions about um, about the except, uh, exception safety of the um, of the code. In this case, we're asserting the strong guarantee. It'll either be in its original original state, or it'll be in the or the the, the hash will be in the fully swapped state, but it won't be left in some sort of intermediate state. Um, and what the exception harness does, or what the exception testing harness does, is it then plays that, that testing code back, um, that test script back, uh, once for every call point that are recorded in the record phase, and each time it picks a different call to force an ex a different external call to force an exception to be raised from that call, so to force it to behave as if that call failed and, and, and generate an exception. And um, I don't have um, I don't have time or space to um, to ex to describe the, the the internals of how you can implement this in Ruby, but I have put a proof of concept up on GIST, and um, that'll be that'll that that'll be one of the links on the uh, the talk notes that I, I link to at the end. Uh, so you can check that out. It's, it's very, pretty easily doable in Ruby. Um, here's a here's an anti pattern. Uh, being excess, excessively vague uh, in rescuing exceptions can lead to can lead to problems because you, invariably you wind up catching some exception you didn't expect and throwing it away, and you don't know why the code isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, but you're never seeing. You know, See an exception because it's just being thrown away. Um, if some code is raising isn't raising a sufficiently ex a specific exception, uh, the least you can do is try to match on maybe the message that the exception has rather than the class of the exception. Um, and um, this is another uh, guideline. This is something that that a lot of people I've talked to have said they wish libraries would do is base all the exceptions that they might raise on a single base class um, so that when you're using that library, you can catch that single base, you can re rescue that single base class and, um, and not worry about, uh, you know, not worry about other exceptions coming out. So um, something to think about when, when building libraries. Now I think I'm just about out of time, is that true? Um, so, uh, well we got pretty far through it. Um, I will just uh, I'll just skip past that uh, last bit and uh, say uh, I'm not going to do a recap because um, I tried to summarize all that stuff and I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how. So anyway, hopefully you got something uh, out of out of all that. Hopefully I didn't move through it too quickly. Um, there are notes on all the references that I made, code, um, books, um, slides uh, at that at that uh, URL. Uh, there's also another recording, I, a longer recording I did of this talk. You want to check that out. And also, tiny piece of tiny bit of self self promotion. Um, I've also turned this talk into a an ebook, uh, which is currently in beta, uh, which has all the stuff that I wasn't able to cover um, in in the time that I have. So um, that's it. Thank you very much.